yes sir one we are live now no jet sir one Angur, please speak uh, clearly. We can't hear you. Angur, are we live now? Yes. Live on sir. Yeah, we are live now. Please start. Thank you, sir. Please start. Yeah, yeah, I am sir. Uh, good evening. Good evening to all. Uh, on behalf of Alcom uh, Laboratories, India's fifth largest pharmaceutical company, I am Mr. Yagish Mohan, Channel Manager. Uh, welcome uh, uh, our eminent moderator, panelists, and all doctors who have joined us for today's anti-thrombotic debate. At Alcom, it has always been our endeavor to partner with the healthcare professionals and we continue to do so. To help us navigate through the meeting, we have with us our renowned cardiologist, Dr. R. Ramesh, who will be moderator today's debate. Uh, debate. Welcome to uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh. Dr. Ramesh, thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. Dr. Ramesh, uh, he did his uh, MD and DNB from uh, um, um, uh, MD, uh, MBBS from Madras Medical College, MD from one of the prestigious institution for PGI Chandigarh and DNB from National National Board of uh, National Board, and followed by DNB Cardiology National Board Examination 1998, and he's specialist in hypertension, and he did in uh, he is in uh, American Hypertension Society in 2014. Uh, I welcome uh, Dr. Ramesh as, uh, on board and uh, take over the session, sir, Dr. Ramesh. And I also take this opportunity to welcome our eminent panelists of today's program, uh, Dr. Sri Chandran, Dr. Ramanath Ramkumar, and Dr. Muthaya. Muthaya. With this introduction, may I request Dr. Ramesh to initiate the program proceedings. Over to Dr. Ramesh. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you for the introduction. And thank you once again for giving me this opportunity to moderate this uh, small meeting. Good evening, everybody. So now we are going to discuss on what the layman often refers to as the two blood thinners. The blood thinners, uh, meaning in this term, in the layman term, is to prevent the clotting of blood. The first part of the discussion will be on the antiplatelet agent, ticagliolol, and the second portion of the meeting will be on dabigatran. These two particular uh, molecules that have been with us now for the last seven, eight years have provided a paradigm shift in the way in which we approach clotting in general, and especially clotting in the small vessels like the coronaries and in the corroded circulation. So what we have found these drugs extremely beneficial and definitely a step above the traditional VKA, that is the vitamin K antagonist, as far as dabigatran is concerned, and clopidogrel, prosogrel uh, type of drugs which have been with us for the last two decades. These new drugs have shown definite and clear-cut advantages in terms of efficacy and as well as safety when compared to the drugs that we were still now, uh, still now using. Let me first start off with an introduction on a context on ticaglorol. Ticaglorol, as you know, is an anti agent is a reversible agent, meaning the action on the plate and the, on the plate is reversible as one good point. The other point is that it isn't required to be metabolized into an active form, uh, which is the bane of the earlier molecule that we're using, clopidogrel. As far as clopidogrel is concerned, it has done human service to us for all these years, and it has been a real bulwark of our anti actions along with aspirin. But we noticed that up to 30 to 40 percent of the people, especially in the acute situations, were showing inadequate or insufficient response as far as antiquated action was concerned with clopidogrel. So, this term called clopidogrel resistance has come into vogue. It is not anything uh, very small. In fact, it is a very, very major reason why there are so many cases of 
post strength uh, thrombosis or the prevention of uh, ischemic events when used either in the acute form or in the chronic form and it is also more important for our asian population compared to the west where the non responders to clopidogrel have been around 15 to 30% according to western literature but recent studies come out especially from the neurologists who have done a lot of work on clopidogrel uh, response and non response as much as 50% of the people may not be responding to clopidogrel in a proper way the recent uh, uh, studies published from delhi showed as much as 50% of the people were not responders and in clopidogrel we divide into two groups the intermediate metabolizers and the non metabolizers of clopidogrel we found that the response of the intermediate metabolizers were up to 50% in their study and people who did not have any sort of response to clopidogrel were about 10% so this is a very 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 major problem especially when we are dealing with pci in acute situation where we are delivering a stent we require the action of not just aspirin which by the way has about 3% uh, non responding uh, population which is manageable but with clopidogrel it goes as much as 30 to 50% and this is a very important point of concern for all inter- invasive cardiologists the reason why the neurologists have stopped using uh, clopidogrel as even chronic therapy in professional strokes is because of this clear point that clopidogrel probably does not provide enough antiplatelet action either in the immediate term or in the long term in quite a significant proportion of our patients the reasons for this are multifold the four major reasons one is the fact that drug is not given in adequate quantity in dosage the second is probably as drug interactions with other drugs especially for example atorvastatin Uh, has interaction with uh, clopidogrel action the second point is the genetic influence uh, there's a lot of polymorphism in the gene which is called a cyp 2c19 gene which is required to activate clopidogrel in the active form there are three uh, alleles of this gene and uh, it's actually a codominant gene there are two genes which do this activation so it is called autosom and is inherited as an autosomal dominant trait and we find that the uh, polymorphism in this gene results in certain people not metabolizing clopidogrel to the active form effectively as much as 50% and some of them don't do it at all so it's about 10% of the population so the polymorphisms in the gene also affect third thing is the individual variability it is for the clinician is often uh, very important to understand that especially an obese person obese patient or a patient with diabetes or a patient with insulin resistance Uh, these are all people who do not uh, respond to clopidogrel as effectively as a patient who is 70 or 80 kg that's a very important point especially when you have obese patients with pci you have to give at least 600 mg of clopidogrel and even then you may land up with uh, instant thrombosis and so on and lastly there is also this uh, fact that many people have already a heightened uh, platelet responsiveness even before they uh, come to the table and in those patients of course we are not giving adequate dose of clopidogrel the third thing is that the clopidogrel acts through the uh, cyp12 uh, y12 uh, receptor there is also a cyp y1 receptor so some of the agents which is also promotes platelet degradation and uh, addition and many of the uh, there are certain conditions especially like for example in a, a stressful state so the catecholamines are in excess where the cyp y1 is used and which is of course not affected by the clopidogrel so these are some of the uh, important points that one has to remember but the moot point is that uh, we are dealing with a drug which probably will not work in two out of uh, one out of three patients especially in acute pci uh, setting and it has also inherited trait this autosomal and codominant trait and uh, the polymorphisms are uh, a, a large in number so one can never be really sure whether clopidogrel is going to do the job of course there is a test which is uh, available called the verify test which is a cytometric method but then that test takes time in a acute situation so we cannot be waiting for the test to see whether it is clopidogrel responder or non responder so this major problem of clopidogrel resistance or non responder or non response to clopidogrel is probably the crux of our uh, discussion today on how ticagrelor is a superior alternative for a number of reasons which of course the doctor will go through it in short time 
So let us take the case one. It's a 52 year old male, came in the emergency department, sudden chest pain from a pain was typical of cardiac origin, he's a smoker, non diabetic, he has hypertension, and the ECG was a classical imperial wall MRI. Cardio biomarkers he raised, the BP was 130 70, and he's ready for intervention. Next. So this is the ECG, very typical, intralateral infarction. Next. So he's been uh, <clears throat> taken up for uh, angiogram and PCI, either to the uh, RCA or the cephalflex, as the case may be. And he has been given 600 milligrams of clopidogrel along with aspirin, I'm sure. Then after 30, uh, three, day, three days after the procedure, he develops uh, recurrent angina. And we find next, we find that this strength is thrombosed. So is this clopidogrel resistance or is it, was this patient a clopidogrel non-responder? Either it is intermediate uh, metabolizer or a non-metabolizer of clopidogrel. Remember that clopidogrel has to be converted to active form. And this conversion depends on the CYP gene, uh, 19. Uh, several polymorphisms in the gene in the general population, especially in the Asiatic population, and in India, for example, which uh, they say up to 50% of the people may not respond adequately to your clopidogrel. So having given the context of our uh, need for a better antiplatelet later that works especially in the acute situation like 180 milligrams of tetrahydrin loss is far superior and safe and we can just assure that we're not going to be facing such a scenario of uh, instant thrombosis or a recurrent or a blocking of a stent so shall i hand over to the doctor to present the further details on information on ticket loss dr ramanathan you can continue sir Hello? Audible, sir. Audible, sir. Yeah, okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Uh, so, basically, like, uh, sir has already given the background for the talk. Just continuing on or, or adding to what he has already said. So, I'm not going to go about the theory of uh, platelet inhibition and uh, uh, the uh, Plato study or uh, anything about that. So just a uh, few words about the practical aspects of uh, Ticagrel or over uh, Gopidogrel. So, okay. so, so Ticagrel or definitely in the Plato study it has shown uh, uh, superiority when compared to Gopidogrel. And of course, being a reversible, uh, being a reversible uh, to Y12 inhibitor, so it is considered superior to clopidogrel. Oh. Sorry, eh? just give me a one minute. Huh? Sorry. Okay, uh, sorry about that. Yeah, am I audible now? Yes, audible. Sir. Audible. Sir. Yeah. So uh, we know that uh, ticagrel or in uh, certain situation is definitely considered superior to clopidogrel. So two three other issues that I just wanted to mention was one is the duration of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy and uh, 
which are which category of patients may benefit with uh, prolonged uh, dual antiplatelet therapy beyond the uh, six months or twelve months as have been recommended. So a few words about the uh, duration of uh, antiplatelet therapy. Many of these studies, of course, patients who have uh, table CAD who undergo PCI or patients who have ACS who undergo PCI. So the duration of antiplatelet uh, therapy is going to be for a minimum of 12 months for patients who have a, a, a ACS to undergo a PCI or patients uh, who have a stable CAD, the duration of antiplatelet therapy may be six months or even lesser in some instances. Subsequent continuation after dual antiplatelet therapy is usually monotherapy, which could be just picagrel or, or it could be just uh, uh, clopidogrel or it could be even just plain aspirin also. So I just wanted to check with sir, what is his protocol for uh, uh, dual antiplatelet therapy duration and which agent do you prefer for uh, continuation? Dr. Ramesh? Yes, I now uh, shifted entirely to Ticagrelor in a PCI and in acute uh, thrombolytic situation. So uh, we use, uh, of course, 180 mg of uh, Ticagrelor at a lowering dose with at least 150 mg of aspirin. And uh, a small point here about the use of 300 mg of aspirin, uh, the rest to be discouraged. In the plateau trial, uh, the only uh, country of countries like those Canada and USA, which did not show as good results or superiority of Ticarulol over uh, the clopidogrel. Right? And one of the reasons that they had uh, uh, forwarded was that uh, both uh, USA and Canada used a 300 milligram dose of aspirin along with 180 milligrams of So The USA else used 75 or 150 milligram of aspirin. So my uh, thing is to give 150 milligram of aspirin and 180 milligram of uh, uh, and uh, proceed with the uh, intervention or thrombolytic. And what about the duration of uh, dual antiplatelet therapy you prefer, sir? Do you give it for one year or the current recent study to so, have shown uh, maybe even shorter uh, duration of DAPT may not have the same yeah. adverse. Uh, yeah, the very minimum is. Uh, Especially when you are planning a, a, another major surgery, which is also uh, urgent, the minimum will be uh, one month, and then you withdraw one of the agents. Uh, That's of course very very rare situation. The other uh, thing is to give, especially in high risk or uh, high blood uh, score or uh, high bleeding risk uh, elderly patient, six months. But ideally for the average patient, a minimum of one year. And in the patients with uh, comorbidities like diabetes or hypercoagulative state, I would probably continue it indefinitely. In that uh, particular uh, situation, if we use a 60 milligram dose of ticket uh, uh, twice daily, it could also be considered after one year of 90 milligrams twice daily. So, use of BAPT is, is ongoing uh, discussion on that, a lot of controversy over it. Various uh, people have their own. Uh, algorithms on how to use uh, dual antiplatelet. But in my practice, especially for urgent, very necessary surgery is planned in a patient with, uh, with undergone PCI, at least one month of uh, dual antiplatelet, and then take a risk and go with the very necessary surgery, non-cardiac surgery. Six months for a patient with eye bleeding risk, elderly, and perhaps you can consider 60 milligram dose of ticotone after that or stop it. I did the average patient with PCI any of one or two stents, one year of uh, dual antiplatelet compulsory, followed by uh, aspirin. And there is no bleeding risk. I think patient, I would consider it uh, to be continued indefinitely. Perhaps I may reduce the dose to 60 milligram of per year. Personal experience of using picagrel or uh, 90 milligram as monotherapy after about three months or six months. Huh? Monotherapy is only up to one year at the general. As a general rule, 
one year or uh, 10 to 12 months of uh, dual antibiotics. So do you routinely for clopidogrel resistance uh, before uh, switching over to clopidogrel or uh, because of the cost of the yeah, drug are being much lesser now, do we routinely give yeah. only to clopidogrel or? Yeah, I think uh, especially when you're dealing with uh, a thrombolytic agent which costs 50,000 or uh, dealing with stent which costs a lakh, uh, it really doesn't matter in the acute uh, situation. And in the chronic situation too, uh, with as you said, the prices have uh, been slashed uh, quite a bit. And I expect with the compensation that prices to go on further, it may not make a big uh, economic uh, parameter, it's not a big uh, consideration at all. Especially because, as I told, uh, the concept of clopidogrel resistance, non response to clopidogrel is so high, and the Chinese and the Asian population is as much as 50%. The response will be there, it's probably suboptimal. And even with a 600 milligram loading of clopidogrel, sometimes we land up with instant thrombosis. It was safer to choose an agent, especially a life and death situation. It's safer yeah. to go by an agent which is proven and uh, ratified. And what about in uh, patients who no require some additional anticoagulations in patients with uh, atrial fibrillation or those with uh, prostatic valves who undergo fibrillation? Do you have any specific preference? Again, any specific yeah. Again, that is uh, uh, on a case to case basis. There are no fixed uh, rules that we can just simply uh, put on as guideline. And uh, in fact, the use of antiplatelets and antithrombotics in uh, uh, patients, especially elderly patients, is more an uh, art than a science. And I would individualize the treatment uh, uh, to the particular patient. As a general rule, I will uh, reach an aspirin and probably go in for dabigatron or loraxaban in the uh, majority of uh, cases. Uh, and as long as the Haspirin score is not too high, I would probably continue the APT for a year along with uh, one of the antitrumps. Anyway, see. <clears throat> As I said, this is a science, it's not a science, it is not. And it's something which is uh, really gives uh, uh, a lot of time for you to think properly in, the, in that particular patient, with that particular patient with Chadwell's score and his uh, Asbert score, along with his uh, requirements of antiplatelet for this, how, I mean, how many stents and whatever is a bare stent or a coated stent, and whether it's diabetic or non diabetic, hypercoagulable risk or a, or a bleeding risk. So it has to be pretty well individualized. And, and most important is to keep them on follow-up and not to just, uh, that those sort of patients, I would like to call up, follow up myself rather than hand it over to the physician uh, because we are more aware of the dangers of uh, either not using or overusing these mm -hmm. drugs. So as I said, it's not rather than a science. When you think about anticoagulation in this patient. Shall we move on to the slide? Uh, just rushing through the slide. So, sir, as far as already mentioned about the incidence of clopidogrel resistance, it varies from as low as 5 to maybe 20 percent, and in some cities, even much more. Okay. Right. Just go to the next one, please. Next slide. So these are the intra, uh, international studies of clopidogrel resistance. Next slide, please. Next one, please. So, sir has already mentioned about all these potential mechanisms and other things. So we just uh, Go through all this. So, to gather a lot is a reversible P2Y12 uh, disruptor antagonist, which has uh, significantly uh, outproven uh, clopidogrel in uh, the PLACO trial, which was, which was a large multinational trial. So, next slide. So, subsequently, the use of ticatralor is there in all guidelines. 
and the considering propedocal resistance to be a significant factor in patients who undergo PCI, it is uh, probably a preferred agent over propedocal, uh, especially in our uh, Asian population. So I'll just, uh, you can just, uh, you can just keep all this. So anything else that you would want to add, sir, or regarding Pythagoras or The only uh, sort of uh, troubling side effect in some people is the uh, dyspnea uh, that comes with use of uh, uh, tequila, uh, which of course can be uh, easily controlled. Probably a minuscule number of patients uh, will not be able to tolerate that uh, feeling of dyspnea, chest compression, or asthmatic like uh, uh, feature. So people have said that over a period of time they get used to it. But some <laughs> a rare case you may have to do it, especially in the chronic administration. Uh, another important point about ticket law, uh, if you want to really pinpoint that and uh, nitpick the whole affair, is that we cannot be used to prevent stroke. In the plateau trial, the uh, one uh, negative uh, parameter that they discovered was to increase the number of strokes in those patients who were on. Uh, Ticagrelor, and that probably relates to the fact that uh, the ticagrelor antiplatelet action is for the white thrombus. The white thrombus that forms is just platelet rich, and forms in the smaller vessels, the periphery or in the coronaries. As compared to the uh, thrombin-rich uh, red thrombus that forms in the carotids and the middle cerebral vessels, uh, leading to CVS, that is cerebral vascular accidents or strokes. So ticagrelor should not be used to uh, by especially neurologist to prevent as a prophylaxis and DIAs or post-stroke uh, treatment. And, uh, these are about the only two uh, slightly negative points about uh, ticket mm -hmm. as, as far as I know. And any personal use of uh, non-PCI uh, patients just with ACL, high-risk ACL patients who do not undergo a PCI? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, I would prefer uh, ticket as over scopidogrel because of this concept of uh, uh, resistance. Uh, those trials that you mentioned about 20% uh, are the old ones. The recent one is as much as 50. And our Chinese colleagues have also confirmed that uh, the non responders, uh, they were divided them into two groups the intermediate and the uh, total non responders. The intermediate metabolizers are as much as uh, half the population, definitely more than 30%. So every third patient you put on scopidogrel, you can't expect. Uh, complete action, which is why the neurologists have stopped using clopidogrel uh, for TIAs and for post ischemic stroke. Uh, the treatment is never sure whether it. Uh, and in that regard, also ticagrelor should not be used to in uh, for neurologists. It's not a drug for neurologists. So that uh, just to digress a little bit. In that regard, now we have got this rivaroxaban, uh, which is excellent in uh, small dose as uh, anti-thrombotic agent for uh, chronic ischemic heart disease, not acute, only chronic, as well as for post-DIA or post-RAND uh, or post-stroke uh, to prevent the next stroke. 2.5 milligram of rivaroxaban uh, twice daily in compass trial. So this whole field is evolving, and I suppose as we uh, proceed to discover further and further in, uh, circumstances, clinically uh, conditions and uh, circumstances, we probably find a better and better use for uh, ticket level, especially with peripheral artery disease. I don't think any major studies have been done. The use of ticket level at peripheral artery disease, fabrication. So this field is evolving. Like nobody expected rivaroxaban to be such a good uh, anti ischemic agent uh, for a chronic CADs or to, to prevent uh, strokes and especially peripheral artery disease. Uh, it is a very bold and uh, I mean, a revolutionary uh, way of using small dose of oxygen in the compass trial. So I suppose in future we can expect studies to come up and further and further new uses of these uh, great molecules to be found. Yeah. So if we can just go to the second part of the study, if you are yeah. okay.
sir if nothing to discuss can we move to the abigatron uh, case study if uh... okay So let's uh, move on to the next uh, section of our uh, discussion on Davigatron, uh, which is the first uh, MOAST to come to the market and has revolutionized the uh, treatment of uh, prevention of strokes in non valvular atrial fibrillation, as well as another important point, uh, condition that I have to emphasize is prevention of recurrent pulmonary embolism, especially in the so called unprovoked pulmonary embolism uh, population, which is quite uh, significant. I mean, several cases of uh, especially youngsters, uh, 30s and 40s, presenting with unexpected dyspnea of clear lung field, and the neck was showing a right uh, heart enlargement. Uh, and of course, when we do a CT scan, perfusion oh, scan, we find that there are... Hello. So these two major indications uh, one has to keep in mind. Uh, one, of course, most important is non-valvular atrial fibrillation to prevent strokes. And the second is, of course, in these unprovoked pulmonary embolism patients who have to be an NOAC lifelong. Well, because otherwise, they, yeah. otherwise oh, they'll end up with uh, uh, what is called a PETP or chronic embolic pulmonary apparition, PETP. So these two major indications are there. Now let us discuss this uh, second case. Uh, man I mean, is and uh, on the examination, it is found to have a population, warfarin, but not taking warfarin regularly. He's hypertensive and diabetic for a long time. He's also an antiplatelet aspirin for history of IHD and history of stroke. His renal fatty function is normal. He has not been uh, maintaining a proper in range value of INR for the last uh, several months. He has LED dysfunction, but normal valves, no vegetation is thrown by, and he has minimal uh, bilateral clock. His present INR is 1.6, which is suboptimal. What is it? He, so he is uh, at a risk of a recurrent stroke, definitely. Probably more ischemia than bleeding. INR fluctuation results in more possibility of a clot and a thrombus and a stroke. So, and he, we cannot expect him to, in future also, maintain his war and dosages adjusted every month to keep the INR between two and three. So, in this case, shall we shift into NOAC where we don't have to do this monitoring? And in the NOAC, we have the four drugs available, three of them available in India. Navigatron, Rivaroxaban, Apexaban, Endoxaban, which comes soon, I suppose. In that case, we have to uh, consider two points. One, how effective or how efficacious will the NOAC be when compared to Varsarin? And what is the bleeding risk? Because that's the more important uh, thing to consider. And not just bleeding risk overall, but bleeding risk in special populations like the elderly. Most AF patients are very elderly, frail. And Therefore, do we have a proper antidote? I think both now Dabegatra and Rivaroxaban, there are antidotes available, very, very costly. But the uh, interesting point is that in the national uh, registry, there were both Dabegatra uh, was antagonized only about two or three times, even though the company had promised it to give free. Uh, so the, the necessity for an antidote uh, is not so great. And of course, patient compliance will be very much more improved if the patient has to just pop a pill and not run to the lab every hour, every month. So when you compare, warfarin is still the gold standard. It's still the cheapest and most available alternative, especially for a poorer patient. But one has to consider the fact that yes, uh, warfarin is what 64% uh, uh, better than uh, placebo in preventing strokes. And it's 32% uh, uh, better than aspirin alone in preventing strokes. The important point here is that they did a trial where warfarin was used uh, like this patient in a fluctuating manner or in a group of patients where the INR was maintained strictly between two and three. The time spent in the therapeutic window of warfarin was strictly monitored. So those adjusted regimen that the patient was supposed to meet every month and get his uh, 
PT done, Prokram and test done. And they are just by adopting a strict visual over the dosage of uh, warfarin, a comodin, every month, changing it up and down, depending on the INR reports, produce a 64% improvement in prevention of strokes. And also, of course, we know that double antiplatelets were tried to prevent stroke as failed miserably. So this is the warfare in history, the warfare in uh, saga. Of how it is definitely uh, useful, uh, much better than double antiplatelet or single antiplatelet. And that if you are able to assure a uh, dose adjusted regimen of warfare and maintain the INR between two and three, you're going to do a very good job, as good a job as in OVC. But then in the real world situation, this is not often the case. So ultimately, when a trial was considered comparing warfarin with dabigatran, dabigatran was shown to be superior, 30% superior to warfarin in the production of stroke. That's the, uh, these are the uh, basic facts about the uh, thing. And among the uh, NOACs, dabigatran uh, stands out as the most efficacious, the most effective, the best uh, drug which you can rely upon. There are some special situations where you probably uh, prefer apixaban, especially if the patient has gastric distress. An important point about gastric distress, uh, dyspepsia with dabigatran is because of the use of tartaric acid in the formulation. Uh, that's uh, the, the drug solubility and drug uh, in, uh, integrity is dependent on use of an additional uh, add on tartaric acid and that can produce uh, dyspepsia, which is actually quite common uh, when you start patients with dabigatran. In which case, you shift to apixaban, and apixaban has the best uh, bleeding risk uh, results, uh, least bleeding amongst the NOACs. So, we would prefer apixaban for patients who are at high risk of bleed or have gastrointestinal symptoms. But overall, if you compare the uh, four drugs, uh, abigatran stands out to be the most efficacious because its action is the direct anti combination, whereas other things act through factor 10A. Again, the more number of steps you have in any particular drug action, the less efficacious they're going to be. And that way, Dabigatran is superior to the other analysis, except in certain uh, situations, like for example, renal dysfunction. That's another important thing, where Rivaroxaban scores through the others, because it's hepatic uh, uh, metabolism. It's uh, secreted mainly to the liver. As far as bleeding risks are concerned, uh, they're about equal, except Apicaban, that's probably a little safer than the other one. The important point about uh, Dabigatran also is this uh, dilemma of 150 milligram versus 110 milligram. I would like people to comment on that. Because once you reduce the dosage to 150 to 110, you lose out a lot on all the positive uh, features of Dabigatran compared to the other enemies. It still does a good job. But the distinct advantage over the other, other annuities are, is gone when you reduce it to 110. Of course, by 110, you're going to save a lot of patients from bleeding. But important point is, even with 150 uh, milligrams, dangerous bleeds are not so many. Uh, especially intracranial bleeds, uh, intracranial bleeds, spinal bleeds, etc. Uh, less with uh, Dabigatran. Overall bleeding, uh, GI tract, urinary tract, uh, ecchymosis, uh, of course, it will be more than the other analysis, but serious, life-threatening, or potentially disastrous bleeds inside the cranium are going to be less with the Dabigatran. So again, uh, this becomes more art than science. As I told earlier, when we're discussing a dual antiplatelet, it has to be patient uh, individualized. And uh, of course, uh, cost factor has now become a big, big consideration with a lot of companies uh, promoting Rivaroxaban in a very, very, very economical uh, way. So it becomes an art for the clinician to, uh, but remember overall Dabigatran is the best NOAC that we have. So somebody can uh, present the slides uh, about Dabigatran. Or shall I do that? I think the other doctor is still caught up in the emergency. So as you know, uh, um, atrial fibrillation is a very, very uh, important uh, risk factor for strokes. And 
the risk of stroke increases as you age, and women are more prone than men. And uh, it's also comes up in the Chadwell score as an important point. So they get two points, and men get only one point. And a general rule, uh, as Dr. Valentin Post used to say, is that every decade, the chances of a uh, stroke event occurring goes from uh, 5%, 6%, 7%, 8% and above, depending on the fifth, sixth, seventh, and eighth decades of life, especially in uh, long standing, persistent, or permanent uh, cases where the chances of uh, getting back to sunrise is the remote. And also remember that even if you, in those cases of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, or uh, persistent atrial uh, fibrillation, where you have re-established sinus rhythm, you still have to be on dabigatron lifelong. Even though the patient is in sinus, it has to be, it's an important point that patients have to understand. Even if you put in a, a atrial appendage uh, device, even then, it has to be on. Even if you have done uh, ablation techniques to uh, convert uh, AF into sinus rhythm. Even those patients have to be on oral anticoagulants. Next. So these are the various uh, categories of uh, population. Everybody is familiar with that. Paroxysmal, persistent, long-standing, persistent, and permanent. Next. So five-fold increase in stroke risk. 3 million people worldwide suffer strokes due to AF. And uh, the uh, cardioembolic uh, stroke, a 30 day mortality of 25%. So, risk of stroke in AF patient not only uh, more, the severity of the stroke in the AF patient is also more than in the non AF causes of stroke. Next. Yeah. Stroke is also more likely to be fatal when patients with atrial fibrillation. Uh, a value of 0.48. Next. So uh, the overwhelming uh, anxiety is to prevent these strokes. And we find that up to two thirds of uh, all the strokes to be are preventable by either use of uh, BKAs, that is vitamin K and thickness, or the NOFCs. Like I said earlier, Aspirin alone or aspirin with another refrigerated agent is of no use in prevention of uh, strokes. The uh, reduction of mortality and stroke is 64% and 24% respectively when you use tevorphine as compared to antiplatelets. Because as I said, the carotid thrombus or the middle cerebral artery thrombus is red thrombus. It's rich in thrombin and much less uh, platelets. But as a coronary thrombus, a thrombus in the smaller peripheral vessels is most more plated rich and referred to as the white thrombus, and this is a red thrombus. So the white thrombus is plated rich, so any intervention uh, reducing the activity of platelets, with the reduction in the numbers or the activity especially, will have benefit. But in a red thrombus, where the coagulation is in towards uh, more production of thrombin and then fibrinogen and fibrin, the antiplated uh, activity reduction doesn't work. Next. So as I said earlier, we know that the use of VKAs is fraught with uh, several uh, disadvantages and complaints is one of the major, major things that one has to uh, take into consideration. Even though it's a cheap drug and that's what we use in our poorer patients or general hospitals and so on. And we run into a lot of problems, not only with uh, the strokes occurring, but also with bleeding occurring. Uh, many a patient has come with a bleed and uh, sometimes the disastrous bleed requiring transfusions and uh, surgery and so on and so forth. Next. So the two scores that one has to keep in mind uh, in the clinician uh, treating uh, these patients is the CHAT score and the They have this score. So, what are the next link, please? So, the Chad West score, uh, Chad 2, BS2, F4, actually, these are the various parameters. Uh, and we see that the uh, female gender uh, is one important addition uh, to age also 75, more than 75, less than 75. 
and ladies are some of the prone to more strokes in years than men as i mentioned earlier so value above three uh, requires that you uh, need to start uh, um, anticoagulation next similarly when you go to the has blood score when you use these uh, drugs we have to be careful about uh, bleeding this and the has blood score is uh, for these uh, points and the score above three indicates that uh, you cannot stop the drug but you have to be extremely cautious and you have to keep the patient under tight control a uh, follow-up and uh, for regular review hello yeah next slide please So the easy guidelines uh, are as follows. Next, so you get a flow chart of uh, how to decide on what to use. Uh, uh, another thing is uh, that many uh, uh, GPs and clinicians have asked me, why not use it in uh, mechanic heart valves? A uh, very simple point, uh, because the dabiketran and all the NOCs are not powerful enough antithrombotics to be used on mechanical valves. There you are stuck with VKs. So in one way it is good because the NOACs are not so powerful, uh, so much so that they are not powerful enough to prevent a clot forming in a foreign object like a metal valve in the mitral aortic position or wherever. Uh, but at the same time, that also means that the bleeding that they are going to cause, uh, either because of overdosage or inappropriate dosage or whatever. It's not going to be as catastrophic as has happened with a overdosage of uh, uh, comodin or uh, warfarin. The reason why we don't recommend, and we also mention always non-valvular atrial fibrillation, is because the NOACs are not powerful enough to be used on mechanical valves or in valvular heart conditions. So identify low risk patient, the low stroke risk. You don't uh, give them anything. If the CHAT score is uh, increased, then we have to put them on. Uh, uh, and also address all the modifiable bleeding risk factors using the HASPET score. Be prepared to follow up a patient with a high HASPET score more uh, properly than otherwise. And then we uh, find that uh, oral anticoagulation is a class one near recommendation, especially in a female. And NOACs are, as I said earlier, superior to VKA for several reasons, right from compliance to the side effects and efficacy. So NOC is generally recommended as a first-line therapy for non-valuable atrial fibrillation. Next. So these are the various uh, studies, uh, SPIRE, FAPSAC, ADEF, CAFA, and SPINAF, EAFT, show that uh, warfarin is better than placebo. I went through this earlier, quickly go through it. Next. So warfarin is definitely important. Warfarin better than aspirin. Next. And warfarin, <clears throat> when adjusted properly, is as good as anything else. This is the important slide. The adjusted dose of warfarin means that you maintain a strict INR between two and three is as good as uh, anything else, but it's not possible in real world practice. A combination therapy with aspirin, etc., is no use. Next. And then uh, dual antiplatelets are not to be used for stroke prevention. Next. And this is important, uh, please go back. Ah, this is the important thing, the fact that Avigatan 150 is superior to warfarin. We're having more or less the same uh, bleeding uh, complications. Minus uh, dangerous uh, bleeds like intracranial bleeds. So this is the gist of the whole uh, thing. The Avigatan 150 twice daily is superior to warfarin, produce the same amount of bleeds as warfarin, but the bleeds due to 150 dabigatran predominantly are not life threatening, like for example, intracranial hemorrhage or intraretinal hemorrhage or spinal bleed. So that's the uh, message that uh, one comes to from these various uh, studies. Next. So when oral radical is initiated, with AF, uh, eligible for uh, oral anticoagulation, all the four drugs can be used. 
in preference to a uh, vitamin K antagonist. Next. Next. So these are the limitations we said, food interaction, drug interaction, adjustment, routine coagulation monitoring, slower onset of action, a very narrow therapeutic range of um, two to three. Next. So among the NOACs, uh, which is better? Uh, so these are the various uh, important studies. They are live for Avigaptron, Rocket A for Tuberoxaban, and Aristotle for uh, uh, Apixaban. These are three things available at us. And uh, as I said earlier, Avigaptron is a direct mode of action on thrombin, whereas the other two activate uh, factor 10 to 10A. And uh, dosage form Tuberoxaban is the only drug that can be given once daily. as a very important compliance uh, factor. Next. And uh, we find that as far as the uh, renal function is concerned, rivaroxaban is preferable. Next. So the primary endpoint is screening stroke, hemorrhagic stroke, integral bleeding. We find dabigatan 150 is very superior to all the other uh, agents. But once, as I said earlier, reduce it to 110, we do uh, lose out a certain amount, a certain bit, in the sense that we have uh, non-inferior as far as primary endpoint and ischemic strokes are concerned. The fact that these are the two main uh, things, positive points, endpoints that we are aiming for, you know, to prevent the stroke and to prevent uh, the primary endpoint. So 110 to 150, again, it depends on the clinician depending on the ASBET score. Next. Uh, Nina. So as I said earlier, so once daily a dose is a slight uh, advantage for our oxygen. And uh, next. So find that uh, Davigatran is superior in 150 milligram dose over the other uh, two agents in the study. Rivaroxaban and Metoxaban. And uh, as I said earlier, the bleeding uh, uh, strokes, the bleeding complications were much less in the Apixaban group. Now let's talk about this. Next. So J bleed, as I said earlier, uh, dyspepsia and J bleed. Uh, more with Zabigatran uh, because of the use of tartaric acid, as we experienced. Okay. And we find uh, GA bleeds are very much less with the use of apexaban. So a patient with a known ulcer, known GA colitis, or uh, any form of uh, earlier GA bleed, apexaban would be better off than that. Mortality-wise, not much difference. Net benefit, again, in favor of doing that. Next. So in general, uh, we have a small flow chart. Uh, NOC first to be taken is Navigatran, whatever it is in the, in the a typical case. But if the beating risk is higher, then probably Apixaban or dose reduced uh, Navigatran at 110 milligram. The presence of uh, NOC with uh, CKD, the present renal impairment, or history of the airbreed, the Sipsia, Apixaban, or Evroxaban. So, if you, and then finally, the patient wants a one daily dose, Evroxaban should be taken. This is a small, uh, uh, sort of clinical pointers and the choice of the NOAC that we want to use. Next. Well, more or less the same thing is repeated uh, again. Uh, only here they have. Uh... Yeah, next. Next. So to summarize, uh, stroke is a very, very important uh, danger for any patient with atrial fibrillation, especially non-valvular types. We have uh, proved that the use of NOEC is superior to the use of uh, warfarin. And warfarin is set with a number of uh, drawbacks, and compliance, uh, adjusting the dose, and so on and so forth. And uh, among the NOECs, the Abigail can by far stands out as a little superior to the other two. Only thing is, that superiority is there only when it's used as 150 milligram dose. Anyway, at that point, remember that the NOACs are not as good 
one as powerful uh, anti thrombotic as vitamin uh, k antagonist which is why they not be used in valvular uh, af or prostatic valves so of course if if could uh, we could use it in patients with prostatic valves also it would be a great great uh, boon but as of now it is not recommended to be used because they are not powerful enough to prevent clots on mechanical valves thank you so shall we go to the questions uh, yes sir there are some questions at the back end so i'll just read one by one uh, the first question is uh, looking at this uh, clopidogrel resistance doctor is asking actually he looking at the clopidogrel resistance uh, should i advise my current patients to shift to ticagrelor or if yes then how if the patient has responded uh, for example let us take a case scenario a uh, patient came with, with acute mi or uh, ischemic symptoms uh, stable angina you were taken to the lab and pca was done successfully with no complications this obviously has responded to clopidogrel so in that case uh, uh, there would be no need for you to shift all patients from clopidogrel to ticagrelor because is, those who respond to clopidogrel there is those who metabolize clopidogrel to the active form as well as Uh, general population are at no risk of any problem so i wouldn't want to the chronic patients on follow up on dual antiplatelet aspirin and clopidogrel no need to change to but those people who had a typical post operative post procedure uh, problem who develop uh, stents and have to redo whatever in those cases it is obviously that is the non responder or if you want to be very technical uh, there are some tests available we can do a platelet adherence test by uh, the uh, optical method to find out adherence of platelets so see for example clopidogrel resistance is defined mm-hmm. as uh, less than 10% decrease in uh, aggregation when adp is added to solution of the patient serum with clopidogrel process so we expect that uh, if there is more than 10% uh, reduction in aggregation or uh, increase in aggregation or adding adp it means that the patient has clopidogrel that's a bedside uh, test the other one test which is used flow cytometry uh, called a very uh, verified uh, test which actually measures the uh, polymorphisms in the cyp to 12 genes 19 genes and it tells us whether he has this uh, type 2 or type 3 polymorphism of the cyp gene in which case he is not going to respond properly so if you going very technically you can do these expensive tests and uh, prove patient is a responder or non responder in this case the clopidogrel should be used but in your uh, general case patient has done well after pca 600 mg loading dose clopidogrel on 700 mg of clopidogrel no need to change to clopidogrel yeah there is one more question uh, as per the trial post pci clopidogrel 90 plus aspirin is recommended for one year and after that fixed to 60 mg for two more years yeah after that what should be the scenario of of this yeah, you can you can go down to aspirin after two years after two years yeah after 18 actually 18 months after 18 months you can go to but as i said there is no strict and fast rule uh, a post a post procedure uh, delayed onset of recurrent angina and so on so forth i would not uh, a diabetic patient uh, hypercoagulable sort of state with what were his vessels like at angio uh, diffuse disease uh, so many things and uh, ldl level always high uh, i would uh, say accessory you have to tailor the uh, choice depending on the various other factors so you have started just the culprit vessel and uh, one more vessel uh, with 80 90 the block uh, which has been uh, kept for the future So you see, it, uh, you have to individualize the choice, especially with diffuse disease. I would rather have a dual antiplatelet for lifelong. And uh, so it's all decisions you make on the table or later. And people uh, requiring uh, anti-angiogenic treatment even after uh, complete revascularization, I uh, would like to be on dual antiplatelets. LDL level more than 100 or 130, definitely dual antiplatelet. And there we have to concentrate more on using the statins and perhaps even consider using a PCSK9 inhibitor. So it's all individualized. Uh, there's no strict and fast rule. But on average, I would say 
at least nine months, if not 12, over nine to eight less. Two years of 90 milligram ticket drug, then perhaps reduced to 60. Then you can stop one of the drugs, and aspirin is cheaper and better. And aspirin resistance is uh, at the very maximum 3% of the population. And the sugar warriors. So aspirin after that. But individualized the resistance based on the patient, the uh, coronary anatomy, the uh, difficulty in the procedure, uh, length of stent, bare stent versus uh, coated stent. Uh, it's up to the uh, interventionist to make the choice. Yeah, th there's one more question, sir. The question is that uh, next year, uh, this apixaban is uh, going off patent. So mm. many Indian companies might launch their Indian version of apixaban. Mm. So what would be the drug of choice in case of anticoagulants, dibigatran, rivaroxaban, or apixaban in stroke? Prevention. Generally, uh, all three are as efficacious as each other, with probably a slight edge for the 150 milligram dose of uh, navigation. I presented a slide which showed how uh, certain situations, like for example, ring insufficiency, rivaroxaban is better, or presence of GA symptoms, uh, dyspepsia with navigation, change over to navigation. A single daily dose compliance problem, like one patient wants only once, once daily dose, then rivaroxaban. So again, you can do device, but by and far, I would say the price point will probably decide uh, which drug I would give to the maximum number of my patients. Uh, just to finish off the whole thing, uh, the important point about, I said, mentioned about uh, changing from clopidogrel to tocoglal uh, a very important uh, uh, scheme that you have to follow. Uh, well, that is, when you start uh, after stopping clopidogrel, there should not be more than 12 hour gap before the next dose of clopidogrel. And the previous dose of clopidogrel should be 300 milligram, give a 12 hour gap, and then start clopidogrel. Uh, That's a very important uh, point. So you have to read up uh, correctly about how to change from clopidogrel to clopidogrel, what is the specific uh, algorithm that's been uh, given to be the safest way of. Uh, uh, I never give it together, that's an important point. Yeah. You can look it up uh, very clearly given in various patients and various situations. Switching from clopidogrel to clopidogrel is not just uh, changing overnight or like that. You have to follow a certain pattern, which is very important. Okay, sir. I think the questions are over now. Uh, yeah. So, ah. over to you again, sir, for the. Yeah, yeah, sir. So... Uh, thank you, thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ramesh. I we take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, Dr. R. Ramesh for moderating the panel discussions and ensuring the audience are enriched with a clinically relevant message. Uh, we thank uh, Dr. Ramanathan Ramakumar, uh, Dr. Muthaya, uh, and, and Dr. Sri Chandran for sharing their uh, clinical uh, experiences. Even though Dr. Sri Chandran was absent today. We also would thank all the doctors who have joined us uh, joined us for this panel discussion. We at Alcom Laboratories will continue to serve uh, doctors and uh, patients by making our products available, especially for our Dabi Clot, uh, Dabi Gatran, Ticavic, Ticagrelol, and uh, uh, Tisat, uh, Telmisatan. I once again thank all of you, Dr. Ramesh, Dr. Uh, uh, Muttaya and uh, Dr. Ramanathan Ramkumar once again thanking from uh, our side. Signing off, Yagish Mohan. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, sir.